Hello, and welcome to the 14th episode of the Christian History Mini Lecture Series. Today, we're going to be discussing a period of history spanning from 1492 through 1521 AD. We have a couple objectives for today. Firstly, you'll be able to explain how the corruption of the Catholic Church in the 16th century led to the Protestant Reformation. And secondly, you'll be able to explain how Luther's view of the gospel and his condemnation of church practices resulted in his excommunication. Now, I am going to be discussing Catholic doctrine and Catholic practice today, but it's important for us to understand that when I discuss the actions of the Catholic Church during this time period, this is obviously before the Catholic Counter-Reformation. This is before the Tridentine Council. It's before Trent. Um, there are a lot of reforms that are enacted afterwards. So please don't take this as a representation of what the Catholic Church is exactly like to this day. Um, and that's an error that some people make. I just want to kind of put that out there, uh, especially for the benefit of, I think, uh, my Protestant students. I want to go ahead and jump over and talk a little bit about some important popes. Um, over the course of this video lecture series, we have looked at the lives and the contributions of various popes who have deeply shaped the history of the Christian church. Um, Leo the Great was the first bishop, the first bishop of Rome, to explicitly claim papal supremacy over other bishops. Now, of course, this does not in itself mean that uh, the idea of the papacy did not exist before Leo, right? The Catholic Church will tell you that it did, right? That this uh, succession of, of Peter's role really has been a thing all throughout uh, the early church. However, this is the first really explicit assertion we have uh, that there is clearly a papacy uh, that Leo the Great is a bishop who has legitimate authority over other bishops as Peter's successor. Um, in the early Middle Ages, we have Gregory the Great, one of the most important uh, Christian bishops ever. Uh, Gregory is, as I mentioned before, a huge proponent of Augustinian theology. He's read Augustine's Confessions, the City of God, and other works, and he helps spread Augustinian theology throughout the Western Church. He helped strengthen monasticism. Gregory himself was a monastic. He was a monk. According to legend, he was really, really sad and depressed when he he was forced to become uh, pope, but then when he became pope, he decided to make the most of it and to enact a number of really critical reforms. He's also uh, remembered for the Gregorian chants and the Gregorian hymns. Basically, he helps reform and unite Christian worship so that it's more in line with the gospel, so that it's standardized across the Western Christian world. Leo III is a prominent pope uh, who crowns Charlemagne uh, in 800 AD. And he's important for many reasons, but one of them is because he helps forge an alliance between the papacy and the empire, right? Um, you know, some people will refer to the Carolingian Empire as itself the Holy Roman Empire, which just takes on new form later on when it's sort of rebirthed in Germany. Um, after Leo III, we have Urban II, uh, a couple hundred years later, actually almost 300 years later, who starts the Crusades. In 1095, Urban II at the Council of Clermont uh, encouraged and called all of the Western Church to consider going on a crusade to uh, protect the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, to protect Constantinople, and also to reclaim the Holy Land. Uh, Gregory VII is a high medieval pope who is famous for his reforms, for supporting the Cluniac reforms, and for opposing lay investiture. Gregory VII gets into a huge conflict with Emperor Henry. Um, they go at it quite a bit. He's eventually deposed by Henry. Um, now, Boniface VIII is the next pope that we discussed uh, who wrote a really important papal bull called Unum Sanctum. Uh, and in Unum Sanctum, and a couple of videos ago, I mentioned uh, Boniface claimed that he had authority over not only the church, but also over different political bodies, over nations, over kings, that there are two swords, the church and the uh, secular authorities, and that the Pope has power and authority over both of them. 
And finally, Clement V, who is the Pope who helped start the Avignon Papacy. He's the one who moved the papal seat from Rome to Avignon in France, which starts the Babylonian captivity of the church. And there were a number of other popes that I do want to pay attention to, to give you a sense of the mounting frustration that a lot of Western Christians had with papal authority, with the papacy in general. Um, Stephen VI is famous for leading the cadaver trial against Formosus's body. His predecessor, Pope Formosus, was dead, and Stephen VI was so angry with him that he had Formosus's body exhumed. He held a trial against Formosus and then had Formosus's fingers cut off, and he desecrated the body itself. Not the most noble of things a pope has ever done. John XII was a pope who, according to his contemporaries and even his successors, who were also popes, he fornicated with many women, right? Uh, he was very open about this. His contemporaries described the papal palace as a brothel. That is what he did to it, um, turned it into a brothel due to sexual immorality. Uh, Benedict the Ninth. Uh, according to historians engaged in simony, uh, the sale of church offices, homosexuality, most scholars believe that he was openly homosexual, and reportedly rape and murder, although I think those charges, it's difficult sometimes to verify whether or not uh, the medieval historians were accurate in the way that they articulated these sorts of things. Um, Alexander VI uh, fathered many children, had various mistresses uh, whom he appointed to high positions. And this was actually not so uncommon, where a pope would have uh, multiple girlfriends or mistresses, he would bear children through them, and then uh, he would have his children actually actively and directly recognized as his own children. He would appoint them to high positions. Um, you know, there's a kind of uh, nepotism that occurs within the church during this time period as well. Julius II decided to be named Julius II uh, after Julius Caesar. Um, Julius II fancied himself to be a great warlord. He was really excited about the prospect of uh, being remembered as a great conquering hero. Now, Julius II did, in fact, contribute to a lot of the artistic revival that we see within Italy during the Renaissance period. So give due to whom it's owed, um, you know, uh, but not typically remembered as one of the most moral of popes. Leo X, uh, the pope whom Martin Luther engages with and has conflict with, expanded the sale of indulgences in order to raise funds for St. Peter's Basilica. So I mentioned in the previous lecture how indulgences begin to be sold by the Catholic Church in order to remit the consequences of sin, guilt for sin even, uh, and this was a huge source of corruption. There were many Christians, priests and bishops and monks and, and laymen who were deeply, deeply troubled by the sale of indulgences, but it was something that really, really uh, continued to impoverish the very poor. Um, and so all of this is meant to give you sort of a bird's eye picture of some of the abuses that we see over the course of the Roman Catholic Church's history, right? If you ask, why is it that people were deeply frustrated with papal authority, um, you'll see that there's this growing feeling, especially after the Great Western Schism, that the papacy is not really the representation of Christ that it ought to be, right? That the many popes who are deeply corrupt and therefore, right, that was something that severely wounded the reputation of the papacy and therefore the power of the papacy. Now, the next big movement that we need to discuss is what we'll refer to as the Renaissance, which means the rebirth. The Renaissance was a broad sweeping cultural movement that begins in the late 1450s in Florence, Italy, and it extends all the way up until the very beginning of the 1600s typically understood to be the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign. Shakespeare is often referred to as kind of a transitionary figure here. Um, the Renaissance uh, was a broad sweeping cultural movement that did not limit its influence to any particular field of study or sphere of culture. It touched everything, philosophy, literature, painting, sculpture, music, architecture, politics, and theology. Uh, the Reformation, for instance, was a Renaissance movement. Um, now, the Renaissance is remembered for its reigniting of interest in the Greek classics in Western Europe. And the reason for this is actually quite simple. 
Constantinople, the former capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, fell in 1453, I mentioned in the last video lecture. And this is significant. It falls to the Ottoman Turks, who are Muslims. And what that means, right, these Muslims, they take over uh, Constantinople, they rename it Istanbul. What this means is that the glorious, most beautiful, most uh, populous, most wealthy and affluent city uh, within the Christian world falls, right? The beating heart of Eastern Orthodox Christianity falls, and there's a mass exodus from Constantinople to Western Europe. A number of scholars from Constantinople who spoke and wrote Greek leave, but they bring their books with them. They bring Homer, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. They bring the dialogues of Plato. And most importantly, they bring the Greek New Testament. Um, and this is really significant because uh, as they move westward, they move to Italy, they move to Germany. Uh, these scholars teach Western Christians how to read and speak Greek. And they read Homer and Plato and the Greek New Testament for themselves. And uh there is this renewed interest in ancient Greek culture and philosophy and literature. They begin to think, oh my goodness, we have been looking at Homer and Plato through the lenses of other thinkers, of Romans, of early medieval Christians. Like they had been looking at the Homeric stories through the lenses of the Romans, like Virgil, or like Augustine, who was highly critical of Homer, right? And they realize those adaptations, commentaries on Homer did not do him justice. There was a beauty that we have not tapped into quite yet. Um, Plato, they were able to access works of Plato that they did not have access to, mostly because Boethius had not had the chance to translate all of it into Latin uh, before he was executed. And finally, the Greek New Testament, they are able to read the New Testament in its original language. And this causes some problems because they realize, wait a second, it seems like there are parts of the Latin Vulgate that seem kind of mistranslated or at least misinterpreted by Christian readers for centuries. And that sort of disparity that they see between Greek New Testament and the Latin Vulgate, that's going to have a huge impact on uh, the church, right? It's going to connect to the Reformation as well. Now, the catchphrase of the Renaissance, the, the, the central idea of the Renaissance, is what we'll refer to as ad fontes, back to the fount. And that is because the Renaissance was characterized by this really passionate desire to recover the authentic original sources of Western culture. They realized that when they read uh, Latin paraphrases of Homer, they didn't do Homer justice, right? It caused them to have an overly negative view of ancient Greek culture and of ancient Greek heroes in particular, right? Um, they begin to realize we have been looking at these really important ideas and works of literature through the lenses of a different culture. And therefore, it's like a game of telephone. What we have from our medieval forebears is not quite right. And that actually, in order to have the most accurate, complete picture, we need to look at the original sources ourselves, right? Uh, once again, this is going to pop up in the Protestant Reformation. Um, another key feature of the Renaissance, uh, the Renaissance is remembered also for bringing a re- appreciation of Plato, okay? Uh, Plato returns, right? For a long time, uh, it seemed like Aristotelian philosophy was systematically uh, dismantling and demoting the older Christian, early medieval Platonic worldview. Um, but all of a sudden, as people are reading Plato for themselves, as they are seeing more of Platonic philosophy, they fall in love with it. And all of a sudden, Aristotle gets demoted. Aristotle's focus on, you know, empirical evidence, Aristotle's focus on the natural gives way to this high sweeping, idealistic, romantic, uh, transcendent vision of truth, goodness and beauty that Plato possessed. Um, and with the return of Plato, uh, as kind of the central philosophical figure, we also have a renewed interest in getting back to Christians who some argue veered in a platonic direction, uh, like Augustine of Hippo. 
Now, Augustine of Hippo was a tremendously, tremendously influential figure all throughout the history of the church, right? Even Christians who are remembered for integrating Aristotle into their philosophy, people like Thomas Aquinas, for instance, they really, really appreciated Augustine. Um, and we'll see that Augustine was, was quoted and, and referred to in virtually all important church decisions and documents during the Middle Ages. And yet, there was a problem during the High Middle Ages. And the problem was that a lot of people were not reading Augustine in his entirety. And that is because during the Middle Ages, there were these sort of collections of church fathers' writings, right? You would have a big book that contained quotes from a bunch of early church fathers that were sort of jumbled together that people in university and in monasteries would read. And as a consequence of that, people had a very piecemeal understanding of Augustine's philosophy and theology, right? And it caused them to have a very incomplete vision of Augustine. But now that there's this renewed interest in going back to the sources, people are reading the entire works of Augustine again and realizing that there were some things that they missed. There is renewed interest during this time period uh, on Augustine's view of grace and salvation. Augustine is famous for arguing that grace is wholly unmerited, which is, by the way, something Aquinas would agree with, right? Um, but Augustine really emphasized against the Pelagians that we do not in any sense earn or produce our own salvation. Whereas Aquinas was willing to assert we don't earn or merit our salvation, right, in a fundamental sense, but there's a sense in which our good works are instrumental in uh, God producing a righteous nature within ourselves. And, and that's not quite how Augustine would have put it, although uh, Roman Catholic theologians will tell you that it's a difference in emphasis, em emphasis rather than a difference in what they actually thought ultimately. And that's debatable, and that's something that the reformers disagreed with as well. Um, now, Augustine is uh, remembered for a vision of salvation that does seem in some ways different than what we see in Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas had asserted that God infuses us with Christ's righteousness through the sacraments, and that through the infusion of righteousness through the sacraments, we develop righteous natures. And it is on the basis of a righteous nature within myself that I will eventually go to heaven, right? And that's why we have purgatory. It's for those who have not yet been completely infused with righteousness. They don't yet have a completely righteous nature. Um, whereas people begin to look into some of Augustine's writings and realize that, for instance, uh, with regard to infants who are baptized, Augustine believed that baptized infants went to heaven. Um, now, there were some people who argued, well, baptized infants go to heaven or infants go to heaven in general because they don't have sinful natures. Or maybe baptism gets rid of the sinful nature of the baby. And Augustine said, no, no, right? Like the baby who's baptized, the Christian who's baptized, right? They still have sinful natures. However, right, on account of what Christ has done for them, God does not count or impute those sins to us because of Christ's atonement. Now, you know, if you're a Protestant, you probably disagree with Augustine's view of the nature of baptism and how baptism relates to salvation of people, including infants. However, right, this idea that we are saved, even though we have sinful natures within ourselves, like we're sinners, we are saved because God does not impute our sin to us. That is going to have a huge impact on later Christians like Martin Luther. Now, Augustine still believed that baptism remits original sin, right? So he still believed uh, in an objective, you know, view of the sacraments. He really did believe that the sacraments, in a sense, save us. Um, and that's something that Aquinas really channels pretty well in the Summa Theologica. Um, and, you know, so there's a question that begins to emerge as people compare different aspects of Augustine. Like Augustine seems to really believe that the sacraments impart a genuine, authentic righteousness uh, upon a person. However, he also seems to believe that rather than merely saying that grace perfects nature, that we might have a sinful nature, but still be counted righteous on account of a righteousness that seems sort of you know, I mean, it's it, it, a righteousness that's accomplished on behalf of us. Um, 
B.B. Warfield, uh, the great Princeton theologian, once asserted the Reformation was Augustine's doctrine of grace triumphing over his doctrine of the church. A lot of people have taken B.B. Warfield to task over here, but I think that the idea that's present here is, is really compelling, at least in giving you a sense of what Reformed Protestants think, right? Protestants such as Luther believed that Augustine's doctrine of grace and salvation should be prioritized, should be reclaimed. Um, the Reformation was in many ways a reclamation movement, right? Go back to the Bible, go back to Augustine as well. Um, now, there was a very important development in uh, the early 16th century, which was the rise in prominence uh, of the sale of indulgences. Pope Leo X becomes cardinal when he's 13 years old. This is probably, uh, well, I say probably, I mean definitely uh, an example of nepotism. He grows up in a very powerful family um, and he becomes cardinal even though it's against the rules for him to become cardinal at that age. And he becomes pope at the age of 37. Now, Leo X is a highly, highly, highly ambitious man um, and Leo decided that he wanted to shore up the authority of the church and he wanted to reunite the church. He planned to do this through the crusade. Um, so Pope Leo was planning, extensively planning another crusade against the Ottomans, against the Muslims to the east. He thought that they could reclaim much of the land that used to be Christian that was taken by these Turks. Um, Pope Leo X also sought to renovate St. Peter's Basilica, right? He wanted to create the most beautiful church in the entire world. And you know what? He probably succeeded because St. Peter's Basilica is absolutely gorgeous. However, there was a problem with what money would he fund the renovation of St. Peter's Basilica? And the answer is indulgences, okay? Now, uh, indulgences... Uh, were themselves uh, a kind of uh, remission of the consequences of sin. But during the late Middle Ages and in the early Renaissance, uh, the Catholic Church, members of the Catholic Church, such as Pope Leo X, begin to portray indulgences as sort of like a transaction, right? That people would be called upon to do a good work, which would be to pay money uh, into the coffers of the Catholic Church. Uh, in exchange for that, guilt would be remitted uh, or, right, the consequences of sin, like years in purgatory, either for themselves or for members of their family, would be uh, taken away. Uh, and there was this huge movement, right? There was a uh, very famous salesman of indulgences named John Tetzel who went around Europe, right? Calling on the poorest of the poor to give all of their money to the church uh, in order to have uh, some of the guilt and some of the consequences of sin removed from them, right? I will jump in here really quickly just to carefully say that this is no longer the Catholic Church's view of indulgences. Um, this is pre-Catholic uh, Counter-Reformation. Uh, Counter um, there was a famous term, right, or a famous catchphrase, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And there were catchphrases and, and language and messaging like this that was actively promoted by the Pope and his lieutenants in order to gain money to fund some of his ambitious projects. Now, a person, a very famous Christian, who declared war against this abuse, against the selling of indulgences, was a certain German monk by the name of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was originally a law student. His family sent him to go study law, right? That is what his father wanted him to do. However, Martin Luther, one day as he was traveling, had a near-death experience. He got caught in a terrible thunderstorm, uh, like just absolutely terrifying experience. And Martin Luther thought that he was going to die, that he was going to be struck by lightning and die. So Luther cried out uh, to St. Anne, right? And he prayed and asked St. Anne, please save me. And if you save me, I will become a monk. And just like that, Martin Luther didn't die, right? And Martin Luther decided, well, I need to keep my promise. That was a promise that I had made to God through St. Anne. So Martin Luther decides to become a monk. He gives up a promising career in law. In so doing, you know, completely changes the course of, of Western history, probably. Um, and not only does Martin Luther become a monk, he decides to become an Augustinian monk, one of the most 
uh, rigorous and vigorous and serious Christian monastic orders that existed during this time. Now, Martin Luther, uh, one time as a young monk, was sent over to Rome as part of a delegation from the Augustinian order, and Luther was absolutely disgusted by the debauchery he saw in Rome, right? He witnessed uh, terrible corruption, right? Uh, clergymen, you know, priests and monks engaging in sexual immorality openly. He saw the terrible poverty of the common people juxtaposed with the opulence and the wealth and the gold of the church. Uh, he also was really surprised when he would go to confession or engage in confession or even practice confession, and he saw that the priests uh, that were in Rome treated it just like a job, right? They were upset with people if they took too long, right? It was very transactional. Uh, there's a whole business surrounding relics uh, and indulgences. And Luther, who was very desperate to receive assurance of his own salvation, even purchases indulgences, even engages in some of these religious practices. But while he is engaging in some of these practices as he is going and seeing holy objects, he begins to realize, what if none of this is true, right? And that's an idea that haunts Luther. And it haunts Luther because he's already haunted by a tortured conscience. Uh, Luther, uh, becomes a theologian while he's back in Germany, um, and he becomes a professor at the University of Wittenberg, which was a new university within Germany that Prince Frederick the Wise had set up. And Luther, even though he was rising in prominence within the Augustinian order, was characterized by a constant struggle for assurance of salvation. As a young uh, priest and monk, Luther would spend just hours every day inside of the confessional, constantly confessing sin, never feeling like he was truly objectively forgiven, right? He would do all of the uh, prescribed penances, but never felt like it was enough. Luther truly felt like he was a terrible, terrible sinner, that he looked into his own nature and saw that it was rotten, it wasn't righteous, that no matter how much penance he did, how much confession he engaged in, he could not produce his own salvation. Um, he didn't have an assurance of God's salvation for him, even through participation in the sacraments. Um, Luther was feeling desperate. Now, while Martin Luther is going through this years-long struggle, it hits Luther, right, um, as he is preaching the gospel to his congregation, that he had been misunderstanding the gospel all along, right? And Martin Luther discovers what he describes as the true gospel, a gospel that he believed that Augustine before him had understood, that Christ on the cross bore all of our sin. Right? This is a term that we'll refer to as expiation, that Christ on the cross became sin for us, that he who knew no sin became sin, meaning that all of our sin was placed on Christ on the cross. Um, and that when the creeds say that Christ descended into hell, that surely that's what it meant, that Christ on that cross right, experienced the most terrifying wrath of God on our behalf, and that we are saved by Christ's righteousness, not our own. So Martin Luther decides that the Bible doesn't teach infused righteousness. He doesn't think that that's the correct interpretation of Scripture. Martin Luther looks in Scripture, thinks about what justification means, and realizes that to be justified means that we are saved by Christ's righteousness and not our own. So not Christ's righteousness infused in me, which becomes my own righteousness within myself, which saves me, but rather right, that there is a righteousness outside of me such that although I am a sinner, that God does not impute my guilt to me, right? but that on judgment day, even though I'm a sinner, I appear before the throne of God. And God looks upon the righteousness of Christ, which covers me. And on account of Christ's righteousness, I am saved. I'm justified. I'm secure. Okay. Um, justification is a declaration of our righteousness because of Christ. Um, and this is revolutionary. 
right? Uh, people hear Luther preach this gospel. They look back at Augustine and think, yeah, I mean, it does seem to be in line with many of Augustine's ideas. And it certainly really seemed to be a very compelling interpretation of the Pauline epistles, of Romans and Ephesians and Galatians, which assert that we are saved not by works. We're not justified by works of the law, but we're justified apart from works only by God's grace through faith in Christ alone. Now, uh, which means that Christ's righteousness is not infused into us, it's imputed to us, it's counted to us, as Romans chapters 3 and 4 asserts that we are counted righteous on account of Christ's work. Um, and Luther finally has grounds for assurance that he knows that even though he's a sinner, because he has faith in Jesus, he knows that he is secure in Jesus. Why? Because Christ's righteousness covers him and it's finished on the cross. Now, uh, Martin Luther was deeply disturbed by the sale of indulgences all throughout Germany, all throughout the Western world. And Luther, very disturbed by the practice of indulgences, writes a treatise that we'll refer to as the 95 Theses, 95 little propositions that, according to legend, he nails to the door of the University of Wittenberg in order to start a debate. Um, it was an invitation to debate the practice of indulgences, and this was common. It was common for people to nail their treatises in a public space in order to invite other Christian intellectuals to have a public debate. That's really what Luther wanted. Now, Luther, in his 95 Theses, makes a number of really landmark assertions, but the first thing he asserts is that when Christ says that we must repent and believe, that repentance that Christ refers to is not the same as the outward act of penance, that there are Christians who are going to a priest, receiving a prescribed penance, doing it outwardly, right, but not with their hearts. And he says that is not repentance. Repentance is something deeper than the mere sacrament of penance. Um, it is a turning away from sin. It is a trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. Um, Luther proceeds in the 95 Theses to assert that our assurance of salvation should not be in the purchase of indulgences, but in Christ's righteousness. His concern was that the Catholic Church or members of the Catholic Church uh, were encouraging people to hold a piece of paper that said that their guilt was remitted um, or that the consequences of their sin were remitted and that they were encouraged to look to this piece of paper for assurance of salvation rather than looking at Christ. And Luther said, no, we are giving people a false assurance of their own salvation. And Luther will very provocatively assert that the Pope is richer than many kings. So why doesn't he use his own income? right, to uh, renovate St. Peter's Basilica. And Luther asserts that it is better to give money to the poor than to buy an indulgence, right? Why pay money to fuel and fund a crusade when you can use that money to do what Christ wanted us to do, right? To feed the hungry, uh, lowly brother or sister in Christ, to, to do what Christ of the simple gospel communicated to us that we ought to do, right? He's really concerned about corruption here. Now, it's really important to note that in Luther's 95 Theses, Luther was not initially denying papal authority. As a matter of fact, you know, in his earlier works, he will refer to the Pope as father. He will communicate that he believes that he is completely in line with the Pope. And if the Pope could just see what some of these bishops were doing, that he would side with Luther over those bishops. And that was perhaps some naivete or just a misunderstanding of what Pope Leo actually was like. Um, Leo X uh, is frustrated when Luther's preaching begins to negatively affect his agenda to, uh, you know, uh, engage in this unifying project within the Catholic Church. So Leo X actually declares Luther a heretic and he censures him. And this has a tremendously disorienting effect on Luther. Luther thought he was just starting an innocent debate about a really important issue that he was concerned about as a pastor. And it turned out to become what felt to Luther like a witch hunt, right? In which he was being forced to violate his own conscience. At the Diet of Worms in 1521, 
Luther was held on trial, not by the Catholic Church directly, but by uh, the Emperor Charles of Germany, right? Um, Luther was on trial before the German emperor, and he's on trial for heresy. Uh, there's essentially, you know, a bounty on Luther's head because he is causing so many problems. And Luther, when he's on trial, is demanded to recant his ideas, right? To recant his uh, uh, condemnation of the sale of indulgences, to recant his view of the gospel and of salvation. And Luther refuses to recant. And according to some historical sources, says these words, Unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Now, there's some debate over whether or not Luther literally said, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, although there are a number of people who think that he really did say those words. But Luther was essentially saying, popes are not infallible. Catholic councils are not infallible. I mean, just think of the different uh, ideas that various popes over the course of this history lecture had said that popes clearly uh, contradict each other, that even papal bulls contradict each other, which means that surely, right, their words are not infallible, but the word of God, scripture is infallible. And therefore, Luther is essentially saying that God, by putting the Holy Spirit in me as an individual Christian, uh, that the Holy Spirit enables me to read scripture and that I can, as an individual Christian, interpret scripture more rightly than perhaps even the Pope, right? Um, so Luther is asserting that scripture, number one, is a higher authority than church councils, than church tradition, uh, and number two, he is asserting that individual Christians have the God-given ability to interpret the word of God for themselves. Um, and this is really the start of the Protestant Reformation, a revolution, a Renaissance movement that drastically changes the history or the course of history, the, the trajectory of Christian history. Um, Luther was condemned by Emperor Charles as a heretic. Um, and at this point, Luther was probably under the impression that he was going to die. He thought, well, this is it. I'm going to be burnt at the stake, just like a number of Christians before me. It's over. Uh, but it wasn't over because Luther is uh, likely in this moment, as he's facing the threat of, of execution and, and being decried as a heretic, uh, he had severely underestimated the power of his words and his ideas. Now, Obviously, Protestants and Catholics are split over how we come to view Luther. Protestants are deeply appreciative of Luther. They agree, yes, the church had veered away from the gospel, right? That over the course of centuries, the church had embraced a paradigm of salvation that veered in the direction of works righteousness, and that Luther was reasserting the authority of scripture over, right, uh, fallible human interpretations, and was helping us reclaim this idea that we're saved not by our works, but only by the unmerited grace of Christ and the righteousness of Christ that is imputed to me, right? Um, whereas Roman Catholics will assert, listen, Luther was right to criticize the corruption that we saw within the Catholic Church. However, what Luther said here, according to Catholics, was dangerous because Luther was asserting that he as an individual had the authority to interpret scripture, and in so doing, he had essentially made himself his own pope, and that he was destroying church authority, right, and was creating a future in which Christians, like in the 21st century, we all have different interpretations of scripture, and we all treat our own interpretations as being authoritative and over the church's interpretation. Um, Charles Taylor, a very important Catholic philosopher, blames the Reformation for the growing secularizing tide of modernity, um, you know, which Protestants such as myself don't think is quite fair, but it's a very compelling argument either way. Um, 
I think about Luther and what he must have been feeling in this moment, you know, in these moments. Um, and something that is undeniable is that Luther truly believed that he was standing on the side of the gospel and that he should not, before God, right, like he should not recant his view of the gospel because to recant the view, his view of the gospel, to recant the gospel itself was to recant God. And he couldn't do that. He couldn't do that as a pastor. He couldn't do that as a Christian. And he couldn't do that as a man. And in our next video lecture, we are going to explore how this reformation explodes and fundamentally changes uh, the trajectory of European history, how it splits the church, but also unites it in an interesting way. We'll talk more about that later.